Hour 16, part one. It's 3 p.m. in the afternoon on D-Day, the 16th Wait, hour. It's of not the 3 p.m. in the afternoon. It's either 3 p.m. or 3 Why in the did afternoon. You write it like that. Then? I didn't write it that. I, I did not put the that. AM. You put the AM in. I wrote that it was 1500, and you I didn't changed write it. that. Well, it's either 3 p.m. or 3 in the afternoon. Yeah, it is. Yeah, Pick one. Right. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay. Leave this in at a time. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Don't, 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 why not? I'll leave it in. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay. Now it's 3 a.m. in the afternoon in my head. Okay, okay. wait. Okay. okay. It's 3 in the afternoon. <clears throat> it's 3 in the afternoon on D Day, the 16th hour of the day, but the action is far from finished. Though, in general, the fighting has moved off the beaches and is at localized points inland, there are a great many of these localized points. Sitting tight at La Barquette, Johnson's paratroopers of the 501st have spent most of the afternoon so far hoping to make a move against the German forces on the heights surrounding saint Combe du mont But prospects still look bleak. The men nearby at Eau and La Basse Adville under Ballard and Allen have not dared to move out, both citing the ever watchful German artillery spotters as the reason for staying put. There is also, though, some good news for Johnson as unexpected reinforcements arrive in his little enclave. Lieutenant Farrell is one of the U.S. Navy's liaison officers that jumped into France with the paratroopers, intending to provide a radio link between the two services, right? Surviving the night, Farrell's small team not only evaded capture, but also kept hold on their portable but cumbersome SCR-609 radio. With Farrell's arrival, the paratroopers have suddenly been dealt an ace. Using a frequency monitored by heavy cruiser USS Quincy, Johnson asks for immediate support from its nine eight-inch guns to give the Germans around saint Combe du mont a taste of their own medicine. And indeed, as soon as the first heavy naval shells begin raining down on them, the German mortar fire stops. Johnson now creates a radio line relaying fire support from Quincy to Allen and Farrell to allow their groups to finally move out. The Battle of Neuville, north of saint marie has been raging for two hours. The small space is littered with craters and dead bodies. So far, Turnbull's small platoon has held tight to their superior positions, but there are many casualties. The Germans have also realized they are facing a much smaller force and maybe should try to outmaneuver their enemy. Rather than being surrounded, Turnbull pulls out, hoping these two hours have been enough time for the defenders of San Mariglis to finish their preparations. Turnbull's decision is a wise one for his platoon, as the first German soldiers are indeed just a hedgerow away. But to help prevent disaster, a fresh platoon of the 505th under Theodore Peterson arrives on the scene to cover Turnbull's retreat. We set up a line of fire on Turnbull's left. All hell broke loose. The enemy moving west down the road near a farmhouse to our immediate front walked right into our hidden left flank, which was stretched out along our hedgerow. Corporal Burke, who had already won a silver star, and three or four riflemen held their fire until the enemy was within a few feet of them. Then they opened fire. The surprised enemy took off in every direction, losing a good number of men. With that, the whole platoon opened fire with everything it had. During all this havoc, a runner from Turnbull reported to me they had successfully withdrawn their platoon. Having accomplished our mission, we made a tactical withdrawal, firing as we left. Together, they withdraw down the west side of the road leading towards Neuville. Of the 43 men that had stayed with Turnbull, 27 of them are dead or seriously wounded. Most of the wounded men are captured as the Germans overrun the stragglers and their medics. Only a dozen of Turnbull's platoon, in fact, make it back to saint marie There is a lot of talk and a lot of rumor and all about the airborne today. And it seems to me that some of it has maybe entered the realm of myth. But a lot of things also seem like, how can I ever know that this really happened or not, you know? I do know, but we can definitely figure out at least some of it by asking Paul Woodage. So, Paul, we're in San Mary Glees now, and 
to certain segments of the general public, there is the belief that the, the fighting on D-Day was actually more or less already won or won here. And I know you're getting mad. No, don't get to say anything yet. No, no, I'm going to get to it. I'm gonna, can we freeze on that? Yeah. Okay, no, I, I understand you. You're dying to talk, and we're going to babble. You're going to, like always. But um, there's, there's a symbol to many people of that, and that, of course, is the pirate where they got hung up on the church, and they say, oh, uh, he pretended that he was dead, and, and uh, maybe went deaf because of the bells and stuff, and he was there for hours, and that's sort of the symbol of stuff. And now you can either, either do myth-busting or myth either way it doesn't mattering. Your choice. It's both really, isn't it? Yeah. I can't say it didn't happen because you can't disprove a negative. Right. What I can say is there's very, very little evidence, contemporary wartime evidence that that ever occurred. Okay. Even before we get to that, what happened here was a tragic sideshow. So a couple of sticks, second battalion 505th, navigation issues, they saw lights here because there was a building there on fire on D-Day that may or may not have been connected to the invasion. Flew across here, there's Germans standing in the square and a couple of sticks of men tumbled out right where we're standing and one or two of them landed on buildings and may or may not have landed on a church tower there. And but a lot of these guys died. Their bodies were caught in trees around this square and that was a sight that confronted some of the commanders when they arrived. But in the case of PFC John Steele himself, I'm just not sure it happened. If, I, if I'm pushed to kind of commit myself, I just don't think it ever happened. And there are certain bits of evidence we can use to kind of back that up. Okay. And the first one is, it doesn't start being mentioned really until after The Longest Day book, and certainly the film came out. That's All when right. it starts being mentioned. The French, the mayor, the people here start saying, there was a guy in a church. It doesn't get mentioned before that. Second thing is there are aerial photos taken latter part of D-Day that do not clearly show a parachute on the church. So if there is a parachutist on the church, his parachute still could be that, doesn't happen. And the, the kind of the smoking gun is the fact that the story hinges on John Steele being pulled up by two German sentries who may or may not be in the church tower in the first place anyway, up over the ramparts and inside the church. Right. I've been up in that church tower, other people have been in that, been in that church tower. There is no way, there's no space big enough with the way it works out there to bring a guy from outside up into the tower and down through the ladder there. It's just impossible. So, um, these are the kind of things we have that, that, that suggest it's, it's but what not... what if it's just a, a Santa Claus, like a symbol of Christmas? It's the symbol of the fantastic victory. It's, uh, yes, well, this is the second yeah, part. The, uh, it's, even, if it, even if it is true, and, and I don't think it is true, folks, but even if it is true, it doesn't matter. Right. What happened here is not the story of the 82nd Airborne. The story of the 82nd Airborne is holding crossroads and vital positions and hills and choke points and nodal points and containing the area for the 7th Corps on Utah Beach to move into. What happened here, as far as the public concerned, this is the be-all and end-all of D-Day, but it just isn't important. And I say that with a caveat of I'm not in any way belittling the loss of life happened here, that on a tragic human level, those who died here, it's awful. But their actions dying in this square do not really make a difference to the outcome of D-Day. Then why, why does it, has it become so big in, in public, public perception and memory? I think it's the longest day film. Yeah. I, mean, I watch that film every, every year to kind of refresh my memory. And I kind of do other things. I'm doing things on my computer. But there's something about the sound of the bells there, red buttons plays John Steele, and the sequence there, and the ding, dong, ding. It's a very well lit, very well staged scene there. And I find myself looking at the screen, and watching it, even though my brain's going, bullshit, 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 I'm gripped yeah. by the storytelling of that sequence there and the paratrooper dropping his knife and being from, deaf from the sound of the bells. That Even that silly bit is the bells had been sounding on that church tower earlier when uh, the fire had broken out as an alert to the fire department and the locals that we need you in the square to deal with this situation. There wasn't some French person still on that bell tower an hour later when they're out there fighting the fire. The need for, for sounding the bells has passed. So right. when he claimed and people said of him, John Steele, oh, he was deaf through the bells, they weren't sounding when he was there, I don't think. So that, that bit doesn't make sense either. And where were, like, the person, John Steele, he should have been easy enough to find to corroborate? Yeah, well... Yes, um, and this is where, you know, in case there's any relatives of John Steele watching, I don't want to kind of talk negatively about the guy, but he was single. Um, and one version of the story is there was a 505th reunion sometime in the 50s. At the time, Cornelius Ryan was writing The Longest Day, and at this reunion, someone, like, almost, almost like James Gavin, stands up and says, 
this is going to be a real major part of this book that may end up being a movie. We want someone to volunteer to be the guy who landed on the church tower because we feel this is going to be a really part of that. And John Steele said, I'll do it, and kind of volunteered to be that guy. So that's another story. Uh, but he, he himself died of lung cancer in 1967, I think. So okay. he'd come here and become a, a folk hero. Yeah. And at that point there, I don't think even if it, you know, he, he's buoyed along by the fame he's got and the fact that suddenly he's a nobody and he's now a somebody. So I think um, if he'd lived longer, I think people have started to ask him serious questions. I think he'd have tripped himself up with or his not. answers or not, because um, it may it may have happened. And I say I can't say it didn't happen. I'm just saying there's very little evidence to support it did happen. Okay, I know we're going to hear a lot of stuff about that in the comments, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah, no, I'll, look to, I'll read them as well. You know, and it's, it's, it is, it is as you said there. It's an iconic, iconic image of D-Day, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not convinced it happened, and I don't, and it certainly isn't important. It, um, it's not important to what actually did happen. But it led to other things. It led to the, then people felt the need. Other paratroopers who landed here felt the need later on to reference the church tower and this, right. because someone would say to them in an interview would say did you see the parachute on the church and they would say yes which for me as a historian is not the way to frame the question it would be the best way to ask a veteran is when you went through Santa Maria Glees, was there anything else there notable that you remember uh -huh. yeah. but when they said did you see the parachute it's a loaded question oh, yeah. okay. and so we say oh yeah I think oh, yeah. Look, I see it today and especially they've seen the movie by then oh, they've yeah. all seen the movie so now yeah. they're thinking oh that was the movie with John Wayne and it becomes a fact and the, the fact that every day tour buses come here by their dozen and all talk about that and click 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 it, it's a story that won't go away even if even if this channel reaches many many people this story won't go away because oh, no. of this well you know Think of how many people the Great War reached, and people do still believe that Gavrilo Princip was eating a sandwich outside Schiller's Delicatessen. And that story, has, as far as anyone's aware, that's not even from the 20th century. <laughs> that was, it was from, a, from a, I forget if it was Brazilian or Argentinian, first mentioned in a film that referenced a book in 2003 wow. in a South America, and now it's become accepted. Ken, you know he's eating a sandwich outside of Schiller's? He wasn't eating a sandwich outside of Schiller's Delicatessen. That was 90 years later, after yeah. the war, that that began becoming so so no i don't think this is going to disappear no and uh you know but the point is let's go and do something more interesting where stuff that happened really was important all right let's hit it there's certainly interesting stuff going on over at omaha again let's hit it by now the exit road e1 at omaha beach is finally cleared and open for vehicular traffic. The first task forces of tanks, armored vehicles, jeeps, and other support vehicles can now move inland. Enemy small arms fire is also subsiding here, with more than 5,000 men of the 1st and 29th Divisions prowling the bluffs, there is little the remaining German resistance nests can do anymore, at least at the beach itself. Over at Saint Laurent, the 115th Infantry Regiment is still grinding against the Norman town, which the Germans have turned into a pretty good stronghold. There are just a couple buildings around the old church, but they seem almost impossible to crack without assistance from heavier firepower. And this additional firepower is to be delivered by the destroyer USS Thompson. This is not necessarily a good call though. Saint Laurent was a mass of tunneled emplacements, not only connected to each other, but also two strong points overlooking the beach. The German force holed up in the town was not large, but was strategically placed and difficult to locate. A sniper would fire from one spot and then show up at another a few hundred yards away, having used the communications tunnels to advantage. Fighting during the first few hours was rough, with few of the rules of warfare observed. German snipers seemed to like the targets offered by the Red Cross armbands of the medics, while few prisoners taken by our troops reached the collecting cages. During the fighting for Saint Laurent, members of the 2nd Battalion had as much difficulty dodging shells fired by the Navy into Saint Laurent as they did from German snipers located in the town. Friendly fire accidents are not uncommon in the chaos today. But misguided naval fire is another thing. Many of the heavy shells aimed at the high church steeple fall short and into the American lines. The 115th will suffer more than 100 casualties from such action in the fight for Saint Laurent. In general though, the more the Americans begin moving inland, the more they realize 
that the Atlantic Wall has barely any defense in depth. Sure, there are still several strong pockets of German resistance, especially around the Colville and Le Moulin draws, but with Virville and Le Grand Amont in American hands, and Colville and Saint Laurent challenged, it seems highly unlikely that the Germans, even with reinforcements, can push them back towards the beach anytime soon. Now from his command post at exit E3, General Kota begins directing the efforts of 29th Division's engineers. Omaha Beach is still by no means a safe place. German shells fall in seemingly at random. Mines wash ashore and explode against vehicles. Landing craft and trucks filled with ammunition take hits and, and explode in flames to get rid of the congestion at the beach. They have to finally blow up those walls at the draws. At Virville, the main concrete wall is three meters high and two meters thick. And the engineers aren't sure if they can get their hands on enough TNT to blow it to pieces. But once wired and set to explode, it proves easier than it had seemed. German construction crews failed to reinforce the wall with steel rods. So there is very little left once the TNT detonates. Kota immediately orders the vehicles to get moving through and get off the beach. The second East Yorks have been preparing to attack the strong point they call Daimler, WN12. Unlike Seoul, which they took this morning, Daimler is a pretty substantial defense point. It's not only protected by minefields, it's got four 155mm howitzers in concrete bunkers, two flat guns, and six machine guns. They are going to use tanks from the 13th Battalion, 18th Royal Hussars, to break this one. The attack goes off, and it is successful right away. We deposited a smoke screen to the west side of the objective, and a troop attacked with all guns blazing. Almost before we started, we saw little dejected figures in grey uniforms approaching from the complex. Rather like Singapore, Daimler collapsed like a house of cards almost at once, since it was being fired on from every side, against which it had no real defence. I'm going to digress here for a minute about a weapon, okay? In fact, if there's one thing that really characterizes the German defenses today, it's their main go-to weapon. This also happens to be an excellent offensive weapon. You are talking about the German machine guns. I am. Specifically, the MG42. There are very few things more terrifying on a World War II battlefield than the loud bark of a German machine gun 42. Its intense fire rate can stop whole squads dead in their tracks as an unrelenting stream of bullets rips and tears through the air. The Allies are well aware that the Wehrmacht will use this weapon to devastating effects to defend their fortress Europe. In bunkers and trenches, behind bushes and armor plates, their universal machine gun is quickly put into action by mounting it on a variety of pedestals and carriages. But why is this gun so very effective? How is it designed differently than its competitors? The introduction of the machine gun to the world's battlefields was truly a military revolution. And then during the Great War, guns like the British Vickers, the Russian M1910, and the German MG08 presented serious weapons of mass destruction against any infantry assault. Water-cooled and operating on short recoil, these derivations of the original Maxim gun could achieve a deadly rate of 450 to 600 rounds per minute. However, all of them share the same tactical flaws. Their cumbersome nature because of their heavy water cooling system and tripods favored an entrenched static defender. The German MG08 needed a whole team just to be carried around with its water jacket and sled carriage weighing more than 55 kilos. This, of course, was at odds with the emergence of the stormtrooper concept where quick, agile units needed the support of light, versatile guns. The British had already introduced the light machine gun with the air-cooled and gas-operated Lewis gun, while the French and the Americans leaned towards automatic rifles. For the Germans, the redesigned MG0815 was an attempt to incorporate machine guns into the concept of the fluid battlefield, but although now outfitted with a bipod and a shoulder stock, 
it was still pretty heavy, and the fixed barrel still needed water cooling. There were other more innovative designs, like the air-cooled MG15 by Bergmann that was fed by a sturdier metal link belt, or the Dreise MG15 made by Schmeiser that had a fire accelerator and a recoil buffer. But the Great War ended before the Germans could further really commit to producing their own light machine gun. The defeated German army was not allowed to have many machine guns post-war, but weapon designers found ways to work within the restrictions. Forced to favor quality over quantity, the German Waffenamt, the weapon office, laid down very specific demands. See, they didn't just want to create a new LMG, but a truly universal machine gun, one that could fulfill all major roles on the battlefield. It must be light enough to be carried into battle by a single infantryman, but also easily mountable on vehicles or behind fortifications. It had to be belt-fed, air-cooled, and able to fire a full-power rifle cartridge at a high rate of fire. Eventually, the weapons manufacturers Rheinmetall and Mauserwerke began producing new Machine Gewehr 34. From the outset, the gun's innovative design, with its pistol grip, flared stock, and air-cooled ventilated barrel jacket seemed unlike any other foreign designs. As required, the gun fired the powerful 7.92 by 57 millimeter Mauser cartridge on a short recoil system. The two-piece open bolt assembly was locked onto a barrel extension and driven forward through the power of the recoil spring. A booster cone at the front of the gun would increase the gas pressure and drive both barrel and bolt backwards to power the feed mechanism. Through the bolt's rotation, it would then insert and extract cartridges and carry the belt. The MG34 could go through such a firing cycle 15 times a second. This meant the gun was able, in theory, to send out 900 rounds a minute with a muzzle velocity of 755 meters per second. Faster firing variants were also introduced, like the MG34S, which allowed for 1,200 rounds per minute, although the gun's delicate interior mechanism began to buckle under that rate of fire. By January 1934, the new universal machine gun was put into service and began replacing all other machine guns in the Army's arsenal. However, it took some time for the Reich's industry to get production numbers going, so it was not until late 1941 that the MG34 was widely distributed throughout the Wehrmacht. In many ways, the MG34 really was a masterpiece of engineering and successfully fulfilled the needs of Germany's mobile warfare doctrine. Soon, there were several different ball and pintle mounts to fit the MG34 on, on tanks, on armored vehicles, and even bicycles and assault gliders. However, reports from the field began filtering in that the gun did not function all that well in rough conditions. Many gunners saw it as overly complicated mechanically complex, and generally over-designed. It was hard to keep the gun's many delicate mechanisms clean, especially in tough environments like, like North Africa or the Eastern Front, where sand or mud could cause jamming or stoppages. The gun was also reportedly unreliable in extreme cold. Manufacturers complained it was both too expensive and too difficult to produce quickly. Many of the additional features seemed pretty unnecessary too. Like some of the earlier versions even had a switch that could adjust the rate of fire between 600 RPM and 1000 RPM. Or to select semi-fire, the gunner would press just the upper part of the trigger and for full auto, the lower part. There was even a reversible feed tray that could be switched for left or right-handed feeding. This was neat for an elite cadre of thousands of soldiers, but not for an army of millions. New ideas were needed to find a suitable successor to the MG34. Most promising was the MG3941 prototype brought forward by Metallfabrik Grossfuss by getting rid of many unnecessary features. And by simplifying many of its mechanisms, the German weapon industry would benefit from a general redesign of the universal machine gun. The new designated MG42 is made entirely out of stamp sheet metal, which reduces costs by 25% per gun over the MG34. It also only takes 75 man hours to manufacture the simpler MG42, rather than 150 hours of its more complicated predecessor, without cutting back on any of the fundamental requirements. 
After some testing and redefining, Adolf Hitler personally approves the mass adoption of the new gun in all branches of the Wehrmacht services. But the MG42's new design goes much further than just reducing the production costs. Grossfuss has designed it with a new roller-locked bolt mechanism that increases the firing rate of the machine gun to 1,200 rounds per minute. Depending on the bolt, this rate can be boosted to 1,600. It also keeps the standard 792 by 57 millimeter Mauser caliber, which at the high muzzle velocity of 755 meters per second can easily penetrate light cover and thin armor plates. Operating the gun is still fairly simple as well. The gunner opens the top cover and places the first round of the belt against the cartridge stopper on the feed tray. For ambushes, it's also possible to drag the belt straight through the feed block to avoid the ominous clicking sound of closing the top cover. Then the gunner grips the cocking handle, draws it back with considerable strength, only to push the bolt forward again to chamber the first round. Pulling the trigger releases the bolt through the power of the strained recoil spring inside the stock. Then the bolt surges forward, beginning the firing cycle, while the feeding mechanism drags the belt through the cartridge chamber. Engaged, the MG42 kicks like a mule, and with its aggressive recoil, it is difficult for an inexperienced recruit to keep the gun on track, let alone to hit a target. The gunner will have to dig his boots into the ground while using the strength of his elbows and shoulders to keep the gun pressing against the bipod. Otherwise, the muzzle will pull away from the target after the first shot. The main benefits of the super high rate of fire mean that a trained gunner can deliver and maintain sudden barrages of intense fire onto a targeted area. Yet, this also makes the MG42 a hungry beast. On full auto only, its ammunition expenditure can quickly become a problem in the field. And indeed, the best results are obtained by releasing small bursts of fire. Squeezing the trigger for five to seven rounds is considered enough to destroy a single target. This is still extremely fast, as that trained gunner can release 22 such bursts within a minute, expending more than 150 rounds. Another important decision overhaul is the quick barrel change mechanism. The high rate of fire means the gun's barrel overheats very quickly. Each bullet is propelled with an explosive charge that leaves enormous heat behind. According to the manual, a barrel should be changed after 250 rounds of rapid bursts. But usually, a barrel was able to withstand around 400 rounds before the danger of malfunction. The MG42's design makes that change very easy. The gunner, or his assistant, simply pushes open the barrel change door on the right side, which makes the barrel pop out on its own. Very thick gloves are necessary, and each gunner is issued a cloth made out of asbestos to drag out the white-hot barrel. But then they just slide in a new barrel, shut the door, and the gun's ready to go. An experienced team can make this change in a matter of seconds. Reloading and changing the barrel are, of course, the most vulnerable moments, but not just for the gunner. See, for the German army, the power of the machine gun has become front and center for both their offensive and defensive tactics. Keeping the gun alive means keeping the squad alive. If it is silenced, either through enemy action or a lack of ammo or replacement barrels, then the attack will fail or their lines will be overrun. So training concentrates foremost on ammunition discipline, as well as preventing, recognizing, and correcting stoppages. It is emphasized that proper maintenance in and outside of battle decides over life or death, and every German soldier must be familiar with the MG34s and MG42s mechanics. But although every recruit is schooled in firing and maintenance, only a certain type of man is chosen to become the designated Richtschütze. Not only does he have to be physically fit and strong enough to carry and wield the gun, he has to be especially competent and technically minded. The German manual reads, when choosing the machine gunners, it is recommended that one does not choose soldiers with glasses or soldiers that are left-handed, but rather strong and well-built muscular boys with good perception and a reasonable amount of initiative. Future machine gunners undergo two main training courses. The first concentrates 
on using the MG42 as an LMG on its bipod. Lessons on how to move on the battlefield, as well as tactical exercise and technical studies follow. The second course focuses on using the gun as a heavy machine gun on pedestal mounts, like the German Lafette 42 and 43, with additional optical sights. Typically, the MG42 has a range of 2,000 meters, using the V-sight blade mount that can be adjusted from 200 to 2,000. But the effective range is, is more like 800 meters, you know, when the gunner can still actually identify what he's shooting at. For more precision, German gunners also use armor-piercing tracer rounds. The basis of German small group tactics is an infantry squad of nine called simply a Gruppe. Led by a non-com, these groups usually consist of five riflemen and three men to work the machine gun. The designated main machine gunner carrying the MG42 is outfitted with a pistol and a 50 round belt drum. The first assistant gunner carries a double barrel holster on his back, an additional belt drum and a 300 round ammunition can. His main job is to supply the gun as well as helping to emplace the gun in the field and provide close quarter protection if necessary. The second assistant carries another spare barrel holster and two cans filled with 300 rounds of ammo. On the move, the Gruppe forms a Reihe, a single file formation. Naturally, the squad's leader is at the front, but right behind him is the machine gunner. German tactics dictate that once contact with the enemy is made, the gunner shall immediately drop to the ground and send heavy fire towards wherever the target appeared. While the enemy is suppressed by these bursts of fire, the rest of the squad fans out to the left and right in a skirmish line. German infantry doctrines always include gaining fire superiority over the enemy, and the MG42 is especially good at that. The physical and psychological effect of an unrelenting stream of bullets flying past at high velocity is often enough to stop an enemy squad dead in its tracks. And once the other side is pinned down, then the German riflemen or assault troops move out to flank the enemy or take them out with grenades at close range. On defense, the enemy is to be pinned down and then mortars and artillery can do their jobs. Each German battalion also has a dedicated heavy machine gun group attached to it. This group has four MG42s and their tripods. Once set up, they can saturate a whole area with sustained fire. These heavy MG groups consist of at least six men and their additional ammunition carriers packing at least 1,800 rounds altogether. But even those 1,800 rounds can be gone within 10 minutes of fighting. By now, the Allies are well aware of this gun's performance in the field. They also know that the bunkers and trenches on the coast are held by mostly low-grade reserves and fortification units, but even an invalid with one eye and a peg leg can hold down the trigger of an MG42. And once the gun's devastating fire is unleashed on the men packed close inside their landing crafts or, or slowly wading through the water, then there could be massive casualties. Sergeant Henrik Naube of the 916 Grenadier Regiment has this to say. I lifted the MG42 back up and recited it in the firing slit. I remembered my father told me many times he had done this himself as a machine gunner at the Battle of the Somme back in the First War. He and his comrades hid deep in the dugouts with their guns and then raced to fix their guns back in place before the British attacked. Now here I was doing the same thing. The Americans were about 400 meters away from us. I did not sight on them individually at first, but I began firing and swept the gun from left to right along the beach. This knocked down the first few men in each line. The MG42 was so powerful, the bullets would often pass through a human body and hit whatever was behind it. So many of these men were hit by a bullet which had already passed through a man in front, or even two men. The only time we stopped firing was when the gun barrel began to overheat and the mechanism showed signs of misfiring. We did not want to run the risk of the gun breaking down, so we rested it to let it cool. We took up our rifles and used them instead. Carl Wegener of Grenadier Regiment 914 says, I pulled the trigger up tight. The MG roared, sending hot lead into the men running along the beach. I saw some go down. I knew I had hit them. 
The bullets ripped up and down the sand. This 19-year-old lad from Hanover had just cut down several men, but now was not the time to think of right or wrong, only survival. After the first few moments had passed, my mind became automated. I would fire as I had been trained to do, in short bursts, 15 to 20 centimeters above the ground. When the gun jammed, I would clear it quickly because every second counted. We knew where to shoot. When I pulled back the bolt for what seemed like the thousandth time, I paused for a good look down the beach. I saw Amis lying everywhere. The gun's great rate of fire can tear through rows of infantry, but other defenses are needed. Artillery, anti-tank, and counter-assault units must be in place to prevent the enemy from countering the machine gun threat. Because once the distinct sound of the MG42 booms over the beaches, then every enemy will concentrate on specifically taking them out. American Sergeant Guarnier remembers how focused the Allies were on its sound alone. I went looking for a gun and found a Thompson submachine gun. I also took a German MG42 off a dead kraut and started shooting it, but the gun made a noise that was distinctly German. The American guns went bap, 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 bap. Every time I started shooting it, the Americans started shooting at me. I got shot at by a dozen or so of our own men. For the German defenders, everything revolves around supplying their men with enough machine guns ammunition, and spare barrels to keep the beaches covered. And therein lies the main problem with the MG42. The gun is extremely deadly in both offensive and defensive operations, but it must be adequately supplied and supported because even the best gun will not work without ammunition. And then what? Karl Wegner would find himself in exactly that position. I finished up a belt of ammunition and waited for Willi to load another one into the gun. He pushed through the starter tab and I noticed it was only a 50 round belt. Normally the belts were linked together for about 200 rounds. I told him to get some more as this wouldn't last long and he simply said there wasn't any more to get. I looked at him in disbelief then realized we were standing in a pile of empty ammunition boxes, belts and spent shell casings. All that was left of 15,000 rounds. The two of them looked at me and I can still see their faces silently asking me, what should we do now? That's a pretty heavy situation in which to find yourself. It sure is. It's interesting that the men are seeing so much action so quickly today, and yet for a lot of them, the past weeks and months of training and planning, especially for like, like the Americans in Britain, it must feel like going from zero to a hundred. I wouldn't quite say that. See, by May 1944, over 1.5 million Americans are stationed in the United Kingdom, right? They have brought so much equipment and vehicles that many GIs joke Great Britain risks sinking into the Atlantic. And the only thing keeping it afloat is the barrage balloons floating above. Mm -hmm. But they aren't just waiting around. That's not at all true. They've been in training hard, week in and week out. The 29th Division has been garrisoned in Britain since October 1942. There is no specific mission to prepare for when they arrive, so their training is often experimental. As one officer will recall, there was only a vague idea of what we were supposed to do. At first it was all conducted on land, using homemade mock-ups of landing craft. Dartmoor was probably as good a place for this as any, for it seemed afloat with rain. We came to know but never loved Dartmoor as we tramped across it, shivered in its cold winds and slept on its liquid surface. The seemingly constant grey British weather is a big adjustment for many GIs, causing a lot of homesickness among those used to the American sunshine. The living quarters haven't helped matters. From May 1943 most of the 29th are encamped in the southwest of England. In wet weather, their steel and stone nissen huts become surrounded by seas of mud. Airmen usually have better lodgings, although this brings its own problems. Bomber HQ has taken over a boarding school near London. On the first night, the officers are sleeping in the teacher's office when they are woken by a ringing of bells. The dorms where the enlisted men are quartered have signs saying, if mistress is desired, ring bell. 
Space is a constant issue in England's green and pleasant land. Back home, facilities like the Desert Training Centre allow GIs to undertake large-scale maneuvers complete with tank and artillery support. But in England, they are competing not only with the millions of other Allied troops in the country, but also with the British people themselves. As a result, troops are often confined to small unit training or marches. The 29ers march an estimated 3,000 miles in the winter of 1942 to 1943, enough to get them back home. When officers are allowed to plan maneuvers with life ammunition, they must navigate the limits of dual usage. The British government's preferred policy to balance civilian and military interest. Upon arrival at one range, artillery men learn that uninhabited roads run between them and their targets. They have to fire over it. Unsurprisingly, the American military is constantly trying to get more space for its men. The most controversial demand concerns the assault training center in South Ham, Devon. The center is established in September 1943 under the command of Paul Thompson in order to train US troops in amphibious landings. But the center is too small for any unit above the battalion level, and there are tight limits on live fire exercises. Planners demand more space. They ask for 25 square miles running along the coastal areas of Slapton Sands. This is prime real estate for invasion preparations. The beach and its surrounding area are very similar to the coastline of Normandy, especially Utah Beach. But expanding the center would displace nearly 3,000 residents. Nevertheless, after some negotiation, the Americans are granted their request. Thompson and his fellow trainers finally have the space to practice in perfect amphibious landings. In the new year, thousands of men go through exercises every week, with new lessons learned each time. When off duty, many men like to get out and meet their British hosts. Quite a few Yanks have got to know the Brits very well indeed. General Eisenhower is among them. K. Summersby has been the Supreme Commander's Driver Secretary since 1942, and they appear to have formed a very close bond. So much so that when on home leave in January 1944, Ike keeps calling his real wife K. The relationship has never become sexual, though. Although, according to Kay's post-war account, they try to consummate it once, but Ike struggles to stand to attention. Still, they share a deep affection for each other. Like Eisenhower, many Americans in Britain find companionship among the local women. And there are around 70,000 GI marriages during the war. But whether it's a long-term commitment or a one-time thing, female company offers a break from the intense pressure of military life and provides comfort for the men. For married men like Eisenhower, staying true to their women is difficult when they are so far away from home. For some of the young ones, the distance instills the sense that rules are different overseas and they can have as much fun as they please. Many revel in the chance to get blackout drunk and be a playboy. Of course, many GIs don't find wives and girlfriends in England. Some are even shocked at their comrades for acting in ways they never would at home. And it's not like every relationship between Yank and British romantic. Mac McIntyre of the 4th Division is billeted in a Devon town and has been all but adopted by the prince's family. He has spent most of his off-duty time with the princess, joining them for Sunday dinner, shopping with mom and hiking with pop. He takes their young daughters to the cinema and goes fishing with the twin boys. But Britain has also been somewhat of a culture shock for many Americans. The War Department has warned the GIs that the conflict has taken a toll on Britain's people and buildings. Still, many are shocked by the much lower quality of life compared to back home. The houses and hotels are old-fashioned and run-down, very few cars are on the road, and the food and drink are awful. Many cities are covered in rubble, and the people in the countryside appear traditional and backward. These are the opinions of many of the white GIs, at least. Interestingly, many black GIs stationed in Britain have less to complain about. There are approximately 130,000 of them across Britain and they have found their state to be a welcome change. 
Their lower economic status back home means they find Britain less of a downgrade and they also enjoy a quality of treatment from their white hosts they have rarely experienced before. Many British hosts are confused by the strict racial lines drawn by their American guest. But the GIs are also surprised by aspects of British society. Many are taken aback at how rigid the class system is. American officers and men are much more friendly with each other than their British counterparts, where deference and respect are essential. Raymond Park, an American who joined the RAF at the start of the war, puts it well. I sometimes feel that England does not deserve to win this war. It has been well and truly said that General Rommel of the German Army's Africa Corps would never have risen above the rank of NCO in the British Army. The nation seems inexplicably proud of the defects in its national character. Some quite like the system, though. One radar expert attached to a British sickness unit will remember, I thought I had practically reached heaven. I was served by a batman who woke me in the morning with a large cup of hot tea and whilst I slowly woke, he finished shining my shoes. What a way to fight a war. Fighting that war is getting closer and closer. By spring, dress rehearsals for the invasion take place all over England. Assault forces practice marshalling, assault, evacuation and everything in between. These provide priceless experience, but they are also dangerous and bring home just how challenging the actual invasion will be. On April 27, an invasion rehearsal at Slapton Sands turns into a disaster when soldiers are bombarded by friendly fire just as they go onto the beach. It happened thanks to timetables moving last minute and radio frequency errors, but it is made worse by inexperienced soldiers panicking under fire. The tragedy doesn't stop there. The next day, a convoy of LSTs and a corvette are hit by German e-boats. The two incidents result in nearly 1,000 dead. Nearly everything went wrong in this operation. It may have taught the commanders lessons that will save lives during the real thing, but it has also made them doubt the quality of the troops. General Eisenhower's aide, Harry Butcher, complains of the absence of toughness and alertness of the young Americans' officers, whom I saw on this trip. They seem to regard war as one grand maneuver in which they are having a happy time. They are as green as growing corn. But there is little time to dwell on the matter. The wheels for the invasion have begun turning. From the beginning of May, troops must begin gathering at their camps. Some have the time to say goodbye to the people they have met. Mac manages to see the princess for a final visit before leaving. He brings cigarettes, candy and oranges, and they all drink good ale mixed with port. It is another joyful evening, but as Mac will recall... Mr. Prince all but broke my hand when we parted, and Mum's eyes were misty. The boys were silent, but expression on their faces spoke louder than words. Other GIs have much less meaningful goodbyes. On a line of empty tents in a cleared camp, someone has chalked the message. Sorry, Jean. Had to go. Johnny. Endless columns of men, trucks and tanks begin trundling down to the marshalling areas. Traffic is so jammed that the convoys sometimes move for about five minutes before waiting again for an hour or more. When they finally arrive, the men begin to realize what lies in store for them. They are issued seasickness pills, condoms, life belts and French francs. They all receive a new weapon and new uniforms. This clothing stinks because it has been washed with a chemical to counter poison gas. The menu options are excellent, though. All you can eat fresh eggs, fried chicken and white bread. As one man from the 101st will recall, the realization that we were being fattened up for slaughter didn't stop us from going back for seconds. By the end of May, all the marshalling camps are sealed off. MPs and English soldiers patrol the boundaries and there is no contact with the outside world. The briefings are next where the officers and then their men learn of their new objectives. Next is the order for embarkation. Once again, vast columns of vehicles and men stream down English lanes. It is during these massive migrations of men that we see the warm feelings shared between Brit and Yank. GIs throw gum and small change to children. 
women come out of their homes offering tea and scones to men on halted convoys. Some even invite the troops into their homes for a quick wash or shave. One Sussex woman wakes up in early June with packages left for safekeeping by the 4th Cavalry Regiment. They are full of pictures of mothers, girlfriends and other treasures. The men know, or at least have a good idea of what lies in store for them. On June 5th, General Leland Hobbs gives some advice to those in her 30th division. War is a series of three things, remember it. Long, hard waits, just waiting. Relatively short, hot fighting. And quite short, pleasant rest. That is the cycle. That is the way it goes. Wait, fight, rest. Fight, wait. And around it goes. The waiting is now nearly over. H hour is around the corner. Well, it's no longer around the corner. It's actually past. Andy, you know what I'm wondering about? What are you wondering about? We've heard speeches from Eisenhower and Churchill and heard from Hitler, but I'm wondering, with Charles de Gaulle soon to make a speech to the people of France, well, to the world, and with plenty of tension and disagreement in the various high commands, how the command situation is among those whose land is actually being invaded this day, the French. There's plenty of tension and disagreement in the various high commands, as we've seen. But we haven't really looked at the command situation among those whose land is actually being invaded this day, the French. Relations between the French and the British and Americans have ebbed and flowed over the months. The central issue has been repeatedly whether or not the Allies would grant governmental recognition to the organizations of the Free French. The French have had the Committee of National Liberation, the CFLN, since June last year. And it was for a while led by Henri Giraud and Charles de Gaulle, though Giraud was basically put out to pasture not that long ago. Giraud had been mainly focused on military stuff, and de Gaulle more on politics. Or maybe I should say entirely on politics. As you heard from Spartacus earlier, the French efforts inside France, including the CFLN's real influence, were pretty much out of order until January this year. It was only after the difficult meeting between Churchill and de Gaulle in Morocco in January that things began coming together. Even then, the incredibly complex political infighting and power play among the French leadership continues to stand in the way of clear and concise action. Spartacus has, and we'll talk more about that in other parts of today's coverage. Back to the geopolitical and military effects. The efforts of de Gaulle and the CFLN were directed at restoring France to her former greatness. In their view, this could best be achieved by an independent French contribution to the defeat of Nazi Germany, the formation of a provisional national assembly in November 1943, and the proclamation of a provisional French government a few days before the invasion were also intended as early markers of France's claim to sovereignty. Thing is, the British and Americans aren't that keen on officially recognizing the Free French. I mean, they were not actually elected, and that sticks with Roosevelt. He's not sure that they would be elected if they held elections, and he wants to hold off on French politics until that can happen. As for Charles de Gaulle, Roosevelt sees him as a potential dictator. In fact, by this time, Roosevelt is so sick of French politics that he wants to change the post-war occupation plans of Germany so that the U.S. has the northern zone and is supplied through Holland and not France. He absolutely does not want to have U.S. troops stationed in France. But he is a bit blind, though, and doesn't see what de Gaulle is trying to accomplish, holding together all the various French factions to save France from complete chaos or even civil war after this war, which does, by necessity, take a firm hand. However, de Gaulle is 100% Francocentric and completely against anything which might in any way undermine French glory. It is he, after all, who wrote a history of the French army and left out Waterloo. Churchill is a little more pragmatic, well, at least in this respect. He's also been trying to get Roosevelt to soften his stance, but Roosevelt absolutely will not officially recognize de Gaulle's government as the legitimate French government, and repeatedly says firmly that the Allies are not invading France to put Charles de Gaulle in power. 
He also will not request a meeting with de Gaulle because that would kind of recognize him as France's leader. But obviously, come liberation, it will take time to organize elections. So the Allied military would otherwise have to administer the liberated territories, right? To Charles de Gaulle, this is just changing one army of occupation for another one. So Eisenhower, as Supreme Commander of the Allied Armed Forces, is in a tricky position. Of course, he wants to use any and all French who want to to fight the Axis occupiers. He wants French liaison officers working with Allied staffs. He wants support ops by the resistance. But although there is a French division in Britain before today, the Second French Armored, it's not planned to go to France until July. And the only French military power that is in action today are commandos, some paratroops, and units from the Free French Air Force and some warships. Thing is, de Gaulle has been commander-in-chief of French forces since April. They are to be subordinated to overall Allied command. Well, that was the idea. But with Washington not wanting to recognize de Gaulle's government, the combined chiefs of staff, who have promised to tell de Gaulle their plans, want to have talks only with French military personnel and not any government-level people. This, as you may imagine, sits rather poorly with the French. So even by today, there is no formal agreement subordinating the French troops to other Allied commanders. Roosevelt has also forbidden Eisenhower from having any contact with the CFLN. And Eisenhower is only to work with Pierre Koenig, who commands the French invasion forces in Britain and is de Gaulle's military rep. But Eisenhower is not to tell him details of the invasion, which pisses off Koenig, since French units are to be used in the invasion, as is the resistance. The Allies do need to brief de Gaulle about D-Day, and Churchill shrewdly points out that it's kind of hard to cut the French out of the liberation of France. But once de Gaulle is in Britain, whenever that happens, he would have to stay there until after the landings are made because of security concerns. And these are very valid. The French codes are so bad, in fact, that an SOE guy goes to their offices in London and tells them to encode any messages they like, and then he breaks the codes right in front of them. The French command is then not allowed to use radios, only secure landlines. You know, I said French liaison officers would work with allied units. Well. There are a lot of them ready for the task, enough for one for each unit even, which is what Koenig wants. But without their duties being clearly detailed, and without any agreement on post-war France, de Gaulle cancels the whole liaison thing. This not only messes with all the administrative agreements for civil affairs post-liberation that the British and Americans have managed to make with the French, but also really pisses off Churchill and Roosevelt in the process. Those admin plans were pretty agreeable to all three nations. The general aims were largely uncontroversial. All parties wanted to facilitate the pursuit of military operations by establishing orderly conditions in the hinterland, relieve the distress of the population in plundered war-torn areas, remove collaborators from administrative office, and restore a functioning democracy as soon as possible. And to do this, Roosevelt has allowed military commanders to settle military and civil issues with the CFLN even, as long as it stops short of official recognition. The CFLN, though, has been busy setting up to transfer the running of liberated areas to French control as soon as they are liberated, so as to prevent any establishment of a military government. They've really been at it, not only choosing people to fill various city officers, but getting ready to restart the judicial, the legal systems, the press, and even what to do with POWs and, of course, collaborators. There was at least some cooperation between the British and Americans and the CFLN until around six weeks ago. See, that's when the British started total censorship of all correspondence between people in Britain and those outside. American and Soviet officials, and even Polish government officials, could still do it. But not the French. The CFLN has a real problem with this, despite the security concerns I mentioned earlier, and decides they're just not going to work with the Allies anymore. So, de Gaulle finally comes to London. The British and Americans really want to tell him when and where Operation Neptune is going to happen. And they're pretty certain he's going to be mortally offended if they don't, right? 
He arrives in London June 4th, two days ago, although he almost refuses to go because Roosevelt will not meet with him about civilian government issues. When he gets to London, he gets very angry because Churchill won't either, and he explodes when he sees Allied currency issued to the troops for after the invasion, which his government damn sure does not recognize. But the currency is because the British and Americans are to work together, and they quite simply have to have something their forces can work with. And Churchill then tells de Gaulle clearly that any time he has to choose between de Gaulle and Roosevelt, he chooses Roosevelt. Well, they calm him down eventually, and then Churchill and Eisenhower tell him the invasion plans. And then Eisenhower gives him the speech that he is to read to the French people today on D-Day. And it says to obey Allied command until the French people can choose their next government. You can imagine this does not sit well with de Gaulle. In fact, de Gaulle just rejects that out of hand because the speech makes no mention of his provisional government's role after liberation. So they say, fine, write your own speech but give it to the French at the end of this day. As for the resistance leaders, they are not informed about the operational plans at all, not the date, not the place, but they do sort of put de and de together from BBC messages and have at least a general idea. And de Gaulle has at least gotten permission to integrate resistance cells into the regular free French forces to support Overlord as regional cells are liberated. They will be organized under Koenig's command. This is all post today, assuming success and continued success. I'm really looking forward to his speech. It should be very interesting. Hearing the live, okay, well not so much updates, but at least partial updates from world leaders and their spin on what it means for their people specifically, but the war in general. You know, just the whole live as it happens global event is, it's really something new. Yeah, it really is. In this hour, the first live recordings from the actual battlefields reached the world at large. While the Germans might have mostly lost the fight at the beaches, by now they know where the enemy is and can at least guess where he is heading. In fact, they have been assembling their first organized counterattack, scheduled to soon go off, and we will see how that goes when we return with Hour 17 of D-Day. <laughs> 